Good morning. Glad to have you all here this morning. And welcome to all of you who are watching online in Facebook land. I'm glad you are with us as well. It's good that we can all be together in one spirit, even though we're in different places today. Now, before we get started, I need to clear something up, okay? I don't know why he's doing it, but Steve is seriously underselling these. All right, now as Pop-Tarts go, I I like Pop-Tarts, and as Pop-Tarts go, I think these are the best. I I think that Pop-Tarts s'mores are absolutely great. Now, I know some people may not think that way, and I realized why this morning. I was looking at the box, and I realized there's instructions on here for how to warm these up in the microwave. Don't. These are not made to be put in the microwave. They're made to go in the toaster. And when you take one of these Pop-Tarts out of the toaster, and you take that first bite, and that marshmallow gooey goodness starts running down your chin and getting in your beard, well, if you have a beard, and it gets all over your fingers, it is just like having a real s'more. These are absolutely great. Now, there have been people who have tried to replicate s'mores in other mediums as well. And maybe you've seen some of these. There was a cereal that came out a while back, like a s'mores cereal, And I tried it, and I want to tell you, not great. Okay? Not great. Uh, S'mores, great. Pop-Tart s'mores, great. You know, here's the best thing about these. Probably most of you don't read the boxes, and you should. So I'm reading the box here, and this has only, only 12% of the daily recommended uh, amount of total fat. Here's what that means. That's only one, help, one, one serving. You can have eight servings of these. That's 16 Pop-Tarts in one day and still not hit the daily recommended fat for a day. So every day you can have 16 Pop-Tarts and still be okay. Isn't, isn't that great? Now, I don't know if you've been counting how many times I've used the word great so far. But when someone gives you a recommendation, whether it be for, for Pop-Tarts, or for a restaurant, or for a vacation, or for anything else, and they say it was great, immediately you know that person values whatever they're talking about, right? And when they say not great, you know that's just a nice way of saying it's terrible. All of us have a a conception of what is and is not great, don't we? And probably most of us think of people as great. Uh, Sometimes there are people who are great, and sometimes there are people who maybe are not great. And most of us would like to be a person who is great, at least in the eyes of the people who are close to us. But the reality is, in this world, not everybody can be great in everybody's eyes. There are some people who are great in our eyes, but not in other people's eyes. Most of you think that Urban Meyer was a great football coach, right? I know of some people who live a little bit north of here who would disagree with you. I mean, even even Alexander, whose last name was The Great, wasn't considered great by everybody. The people he conquered didn't really like him. You see, different people have different ideas about what is great. The world has a different idea about what is great than Jesus did. Jesus has some, some interesting teachings on what it means to be great, And they're very different than what the world teaches us about being great. You see, the world says that to be famous is to be great. But we know that's not really true. Because to be famous is simply that everybody knows your name. And just because we know somebody's name doesn't mean they were great. Everybody knows the name of Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. Everybody knows the name of Jim Jones or Ted Bundy. And yet we would all say these are not great people. Sometimes the world tells us that to be rich is to be great. Uh, But we know is that often money leads us to places we'd rather not end up. And oftentimes it's the people who are most wealthy who are most awful. And we would all say, I know people or I've seen people or I know of people who are rich but who are not great. And sometimes, sometimes the world tells us, well, to be powerful, that's to be great. But we all know that power corrupts. And often the more power we have, the more corrupt we become. And so the world's idea of greatness, we know it doesn't ring true. This morning, I want to talk to you not about what the world says is great, but what Jesus says 
is great. There's a story in Mark chapter 9. This is a great story. Uh, Jesus and his disciples have just gone on a journey, and they've arrived, and he says to them, hey guys, what were you talking about? Apparently they were walking behind Jesus uh, while they were traveling and having this conversation amongst themselves about who was the greatest. I like to envision in my mind what that conversation looked like. Can you imagine it? Peter, because Peter always talks first and talks most, says to the guys, hey guys, did you see at that last village when I cast that demon out? Did you see what great form I had? Am I great or what? And Andrew, who's always kind of the tempering force, says, Peter, Peter, that's not true greatness. Did you guys notice how many people I've brought to Jesus? I've brought more people to Jesus than any of you. So obviously I am the greatest of all. And John steps in and says, well, Peter, Andrew, and the rest of you, I don't know if you've been paying attention. But whenever we walk somewhere, have you noticed that I'm the one who walks right next to Jesus? So obviously he thinks that I am the greatest. Now the disciples knew they shouldn't be having this conversation. So when Jesus says to them, hey guys, what were you talking about on the journey? They're totally quiet because they're a little bit embarrassed. Let me read the story. This is, this is from Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 33. It says, And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who is the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, This is what it means to be great. He said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last and servant of all. Jesus' greatness, guys, greatness is not what you think it is. If you want to be great, you have to be last. I don't like to be last. Most people, I don't think anybody likes to be last. I remember back in elementary when we were in PE class and they were choosing teams, and maybe some of you can empathize with me on this one. I, I didn't care if I got chose first. But I did not want to get picked last because nobody likes to be last. When you're at Kroger and you're filling up your grocery cart, nobody gets their cart all full and gets to the front of the store and then looks for the longest checkout line. We look for the quickest checkout line because why? We want to be first, not last. You see, greatness in Jesus' mind, greatness goes against what we naturally want. We naturally want to get out in front of other people. And Jesus says, no, you have to get behind other people. Jesus says, if you want to be great, you have to stop trying to get ahead of others. If you want to lead other people, if you want to be great in the eyes of God, you have to set your own agenda aside and stop pushing everybody else out of the way. But Jesus doesn't just say you have to be last. He says if anybody would be first, he would be last and he would be a, a servant. Again, this is something that doesn't come naturally. Nobody, nobody is looking for a job as a servant because we think of that as kind of menial work. Now, now there have been television shows over the time that have kind of glorified the idea of being a butler. Uh, what was the name? Jeffrey on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Mr. Belvedere, some of you will remember him. But the reality is nobody wants to be a servant. Everybody would much rather be the master because it's the master that gives the orders. The servant has to do whatever they're told. So, so that's not great. What's great is to give the orders. But Jesus says, no, actually, guys, in my kingdom, which is a little upside down, the servant is the one who's great. And what Jesus is getting at here is that if you want to be great, not only do you have to stop trying to get ahead of others, but you have to start trying to serve others. You have to start trying to help others. Now, at this point, I would be okay if Jesus stopped here. i say, you know what, that, that's a little hard, it's a little difficult, but I can do this. I can learn to be last, I can learn to be a servant, but Jesus wasn't done. He added this word at the end, and let's be honest, I think we all wish he hadn't. He said, you have to be the servant of all. So it's not enough just to serve your family or your friends or the people you like or the people who are good to you. He says serve all, and that means Jesus is calling on us to serve the people we don't like the people who don't like us. 
the people who do evil towards us. Jesus says, if you want to be great, you have to serve everybody. This is a good place for me to pause for a moment and point out that what Jesus is telling his disciples to do is exactly what he has already done. Jesus was the ultimate first. He, he's God. He's the, the creator. Before anything else existed, Jesus was. He is the ultimate first, and he made himself last by setting aside his claims to be God and coming to earth to become a person. And the reason he made himself last was so he could do what? He could serve us. All of us. You see, Jesus served us all by dying for us all. Jesus died for the people who killed him. Let that sink in for a second. Jesus died for the people who killed him. Now, we're not the ones who put the nails in his hand. But it was our sin that sent him to the cross. And so Jesus died for us. Now, what we're talking about this morning, how to be great, this is, this is really a response that we have to what Jesus has done for us. And so this is really mostly directed at people who are already Jesus followers. But I need to stop right here and say the starting point for all of us has to be that moment in life when we realize who Jesus is and what he's done for us and what he expects from us. And when you realize that Jesus is God become man who gave his life for me to, so that I could have forgiveness of my sins and I give my life to him, that's where my journey begins. You see, I can do what Jesus tells me to do. That's not what makes me favorable in God's eyes. God doesn't look at me with favor because I obey him so well. God looks on me with favor because of what Jesus has already done for me. And so I want to remind all of you this morning that your journey has to start there, giving your life to Jesus. And once you've become his follower, now it's time to say, what does this mean for me? How do I look like Jesus? This is where I start talking about what it means to be great. So Jesus says to his disciples, look, if you're my follower, this is what I expect of you. You need to be last, stop trying to push your way to the front, and you need to serve everyone. But Jesus' disciples didn't always get it right. And so John responds, verse 38, by saying, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. I, I don't know what John is doing here. I don't know why he's saying this. If somehow he thinks this is going to make Jesus think he's great. But essentially, what John is responding to is Jesus saying you have to serve all. And John is saying, really, Jesus, do you really mean all? Because there's this guy over here who, he's not a part of our group. And so we're trying to stop him because he's not one of us. When you say all, Jesus, you don't really mean everybody. You're talking about all of us in our little circle, Right? And Jesus responds by saying, do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. Jesus says, actually, John, our circle is a lot bigger than you think. Yeah, they may not be walking with us, but they're still on our team. Yes, John, when I said be the servant of all, I meant all. Sometimes as Christians, we like to define our little circle, don't we? Like say, this is, this is our group here, and those people over there, they're not really a part of it. So on Thursday night, uh, the mighty Browns took on the mighty Bengals, right? And I don't know, I didn't even watch that game because who wants to see those two teams play? <laughs> but I know a lot of you do, and you Browns fans were pretty excited because your team won. And it would be really easy for you as a Browns fan to say, you know what, this is our circle. Everybody who likes the Browns loves Jesus. And people who like the Bengals, well, they don't. And, and you Bengals fans, you might be disappointed when you say, you know what, that's okay because Jesus called us to suffer. <laughs> and so everybody who loves the Bengals is loved by Jesus because we suffer. And if you don't love the Bengals, then you're kind of out of the circle. And maybe you're sitting right now saying, David, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. In the church, we would never determine who's in and who's out by who likes which football team. Of course not. But let's talk about Republicans and Democrats. Because sometimes there's this tendency, right? Right? To say, here's our circle. And everybody who votes like us is in. 
And if you have signs of the other guy in your yard, then you're out. And we like to have this idea that, yeah, I'll serve others because Jesus says the great people are the ones who serve others. And so I'll serve others, but I'm not going to serve them. They're not in our circle. But what Jesus says is if you want to be great, you have to be the servant of all. Here's the principle. Jesus' principle of greatness is that if you want to be great, you need to learn to deal generously with others. Not just the people who are like you, who have the same background as you, who look like you, who talk like you. Not just the people you like or the people who are in your family. Not just the people who are around you most of the time. Not just the people who vote like you. You have to deal generously with everyone, and that means dealing generously with the people who are not like you. Dealing generously with the people who are not nice to you. Dealing generously with the people who are sometimes evil towards you. You see, here's what it means to deal generously. To deal generously with others means giving them more and less than they deserve. If I want to deal generously with someone else, I have to give them more than they deserve. They may not have earned my love, but I will give them more than they deserve. They may not have earned my grace, but I will give them more than they deserve. Do you see how this works? If I want to deal generously with others, then I will give them more love, more grace, more kindness, more forgiveness than they deserve. And I will give them less than they deserve. It's really easy for me to say, well, this person deserves my revenge because they did something awful to me. But if I'm going to be generous with them, I'm going to give them less than they deserve. I mean, this person, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind because they've earned it. They're not measuring up to my expectations. But to be generous means to give them less than they deserve. I might say, yeah, you know what? I'm holding a grudge against this person because they did such evil to me. They said such horrible things about me or to me. They deserve it. But to be generous means I give them less than they deserve. Jesus says, I want you to deal generously with others. And that means just as I have given you more and less than you deserve, I want you to give others more and less than they deserve. I heard a song this morning on my way in, and in one of the lines I was like, that's it. That's exactly what I'm talking about this morning. I don't even know the name of the song. It's Tim McGraw. And in the middle of the song, he says, you've got mountains to climb. Always be humble and kind. It's like, that, that's it. So we all have mountains we want to climb, right? Because we want to be great. We want to achieve. We want to accomplish. We want to win. We want to be the best. And so we've got these mountains to climb. And Tim McGraw, who I think is maybe drawing from Jesus a little bit here, says, yeah, that's great, but be humble and kind. That's what Jesus is saying. If you want to be great, if you want to win, it starts with being kind. But there's also this other piece that's being humble, right? And this brings us to part two of Jesus' formula for greatness. The first part is deal generously with others. Part two of the formula for greatness is deal ruthlessly with yourself. Deal ruthlessly with yourself. And what I mean is how you think about yourself. How you evaluate yourself. Often, how you make excuses for yourself. You see, what we like to do, this is what comes naturally to us, is that we deal generously with ourselves and ruthlessly with others, right? It's easy for me to judge others based on what they do because they do evil things. But myself, I'm going to judge my motives because even though I did something wrong, I had a good reason for it. Imagine tonight at the Bonfire Fest, I'm talking to you and I I point across the way and I say, hey, see Merle over there? You know, I saw him eat three s'mores. And people who eat three s'mores are evil. They're selfish. They're gluttons. Merle is evil, and he's selfish, and he's a glutton because he ate three s'mores. And just at that moment, someone walks up to me and says, Hey, David, hey, isn't that your third s'more? And I immediately say, Oh, it is, but but you don't understand. I, I skipped lunch today because I was praying 
And so I'm really hungry, so it's okay for me to have three s'mores. What have I just done? Well, I've been very generous with myself, and I've been very ruthless with Merle. You see, Jesus says, if you want to be great, you've got to flip that around. You have to learn how to deal generously with others and deal ruthlessly with yourself. Now, imagine for a minute what our political dialogue would look like if we could implement this principle. What if all of us said that from now until the election, I am going to choose to deal ruthlessly with my own candidate and deal generously with the other candidate. So if I'm a Donald Trump fan, that means that I am going to ruthlessly critique what he does and what he says. But I'm going to be extraordinarily generous in my evaluation of Joe Biden. Or if I'm a Joe Biden supporter, I am going to ruthlessly critique what he does and he says, and I am going to be extraordinarily generous in what I believe about Donald Trump. How does this change the way we have conversations? See, Jesus says if you want to be great, you've got to flip what's natural around and learn how to be generous to others while being ruthless to yourself. Listen to what he says in the next verses. Verse 43, he says, And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Jesus here, he's creating a comparison between what's happening right now and what's happening down the road. And what he's saying to us is, look, it is better to cause yourself short-term pain than to endure long-term regret. It is better for you to deal ruthlessly with yourself in the moment than to spend the rest of your life wishing you had. Now, we all understand the principle that sometimes short-term pleasure leads to long-term pain, right? People who have been caught up in the world of gambling, there's this rush, this high in the moment. You know, you put everything on the line, and sometimes you win, but most of the time you lose. The house always wins, right? And before long, you become addicted, and you find yourself in this hole that you never thought you'd be in because that short-term pleasure turned into long-term pain. If you overeat, if you really do eat 16 s'more Pop-Tarts, that's going to be great in the moment because they are delicious, especially when they're out of the toaster. But a little bit later on, you're going to regret it. And if you continually do this, it's terrible for your body. And eventually you discover that short-term pleasure leads to long-term pain. And so Jesus says, look, deal ruthlessly with yourself. It is better to endure short-term pain than long-term regret. He talks about our hands and our feet and our eyes. I think when we think about our hands, we're talking about what it is that we do, how we spend our time. And Jesus is saying, if what you do pulls you away from me, if what you do causes you to not be able to follow me as closely, then cut it off. Let go of it. You cannot be great if your actions keep you from Jesus. He talks about our feet, and our feet is where we go. So the environments in which we place ourselves. I think this is talking a lot about influence. The people around us, the the places that we let speak into us. And Jesus is saying, ruthlessly evaluate who and what is influencing you. And if your influences are taking you further from me than closer to me, then cut them off. You cannot be great if you're being influenced away from Jesus. What about our eyes? Our eyes is what we look at. It's our perspective. It's what we focus on. And can we be honest? Naturally, all of us tend to focus on ourselves. All of us tend to look at life through this lens of what's good for me. And Jesus is saying, if your focus is always yourself, you can never be great. Because to be great, you have to go to the back of the line. And so if your focus, if your perspective is always, what do I want? What do I need? What's good for me? Jesus says what? Cut it off. 
deal ruthlessly with yourself. This morning, as I was wrapping up my, my preparation time, I, I wrote three notes to myself. Okay? These are kind of my three applications for self as I think through what it means to be great in the eyes of Jesus. I'm just going to share them with you real quick. I wrote, the first one is this. I need to spend my time finding ways to be generous to others, not just those in my own circle. All people. If I want to be great, I need to spend my time, I need to use my hands to figure out how I can be generous to everyone. Number two, I said, I need to surround myself with people and influences who will help me see myself accurately and will help me change to be more like Jesus. You see, often we're blind to ourselves. We don't see our own flaws and our own shortcomings, and so we need to surround ourselves with influencers, with people who will point that out to us so that we can deal ruthlessly with ourselves. And number three, I said, I need to focus on being last instead of first. Instead of focusing on being served, I need to focus on serving others. You see, in the minds of many, greatness is the result of defeating the bad people. It's earning victory over those who do evil or those who do evil to me. But Jesus said that greatness is the result of defeating the evil within so that you can give to others what he's already given to you. Many of you may know the story of Corrie Ten Boom. Uh, she was a young Dutch girl who grew up in Holland. Her father was a watchmaker. And during World War II, when the Nazis invaded Holland, she and her family hid as many Jewish people as they could from the Nazis. Eventually, they were discovered. And all of her family was taken away to concentration camps. And most of them died in those camps, but she survived. And she spent the rest of her life traveling around, telling her story. She wrote a great book called The Hiding Place. I want to read you a story that, that she wrote. And uh, I could summarize it, but I think it's better just hearing her words. So, so listen to me, uh, these words of Corey Ten Boom. She writes, It was in a church in Munich that I saw him. A balding, heavyset man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947. And I had come from Holland to defeat Germany with the message that God forgives. Context. World War II ended in 1945. This is just two years after the war. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land. And I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. And the solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence, in silence collected their wraps, and in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, and the next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp, beneath her parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland, and this man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? 
but I remembered him. And the leather crop swinging from his belt. This was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. And again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I, whose sins had every day to be forgiven, and I could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men in their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but also as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives. But those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. This is greatness. You see, victory didn't come for Corey Ten Boom because she overcame the German soldier. For her, victory came because she overcame herself. She made herself last so that she could serve him by forgiving him. Victory is not defeating the people around us. Victory is not defeating the people who do evil or who do evil to us. Victory is defeating the evil within ourselves by giving it over to our Heavenly Father, by releasing it to Him, by humbling ourselves and making ourselves last so that we can serve the others around us. The temptation in life is to be first. The temptation in life is to be best. The temptation in life is to always win. Choose instead to be last. Choose instead to serve. Because in that, Jesus says, you will be great. Let's pray. Father, these words are not easy. And we come to you and acknowledge that we often fall short of the standard set by Jesus. And we are so grateful that his death and resurrection covers all of our shortcomings. And so you don't see us as failures, but you see us as victors because of him. And yet we want to represent you well. And so this week as we wrestle with what it means to put ourselves last, and we wrestle with what it means to serve those around us, even those who may be difficult to serve, I pray that your spirit would empower us 
so that we would show the world what it means to be loved by you and forgiven by you so that they also can know you as we do. Thank you for the greatness of your son. Father, help us to mirror that greatness to his world. In your name.